Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Hello to everyone. I'm Louisa Kasdan, your host for Let's Talk About Food, a podcast devoted to first-person storytelling where food plays a pivotal, if not a starring role. Everyone has a food story. Food is at the heart of human connection, at the center of love, of ritual, of need and want, and most of all, food creates community. And community is what we crave. Our guest today is Kirsten Sans Toby. Kirsten co founded Revolution Foods in 2006. Both Kirsten and her co founder, Kristen Richmond, needed a project for a B school class they were taking. They bonded and soared over the idea that school food could be both craveable and healthy. Their school project became Revolution Foods, a California based B Corp to build lifelong healthy eaters by making kid inspired, chef crafted food accessible to all. From its start in Oakland, California, Revolution Foods has gained national recognition for its innovative approach to school food. Revolution Foods, now over 100 million in revenue, serves over 1 million healthy, affordable meals per week and is the leading school food provider in California. Let's hear from Kirsten. Kirsten, have I done any justice to the origin story of Revolution Foods? I think it sounds great. I think you did a great job. Well, thank you. But talk to me about what Revolution Foods is today, and then we'll go back a little bit. Give me the metrics on how many incredible major school systems you're supplying and how many kids and other people you're feeding every day. Yeah. The last year has brought a lot of change for us as we've been coming out of the pandemic. We are continuing to be very focused on making high-quality food accessible to low-income schools. We're also incredibly focused on making sure that our enterprise can be around for the long term and be financially sustainable. Like so many companies, the pandemic gave us a wake-up call about needing to have a stable foundation that we can fall back on in hard times and, and give us a foundation for growth in good times. Over the last year, we have increased our focus on schools in California. Um, across California, we are now serving over 500 school sites. We see California really as a sort of optimal policy environment for school food right now with statewide universal school meals, higher than ever reimbursement rates for school meals for low-income kids. I would say right now, very focused on proving the concept in California that we can provide high quality, healthy meals to every student. Are you essentially retrenching and focusing more on California and pulling back from the school districts on the East Coast and the South Coast and Washington and Chicago and all of that? We are moving in that direction. It's out of a fiscal necessity. We've been really making sure that the company can be both 
having a high impact, which is what we've been focused on for a long, long time, is growing and having an impact in more and more places, but also that we're not reliant on outside sources of funding in order to do that. So we're focused right now on getting the company to a self-sustaining place from a financial perspective, and that's involving needing to focus in on a smaller number of schools for a short amount of time while we stabilize that foundation and finding other ways to support schools on the East Coast that we have historically Mm -hmm. had a commitment to. But it does mean that we are moving in the direction of increased focus in California for now while finding other solutions for our partners on the East Coast. Hmm. Interesting. I'll ask you more about this later, but let's start at the very beginning. The romantic story I've always imagined is that somehow you and your co-founder, Kristen, (laughs) were sitting down one day at a cafeteria or in a classroom and discovered that you both had the same interest. But what really happened? How did you build this company? Yeah, well, so Kristen and I, we had two different classes that we took together in our business school experience. And we were in both of the classes at the same time. One was a social entrepreneurship class. So the task in that class was identify a social issue and then write a business plan for a company or an organization might address that social challenge. The other class was a new product development class. You were supposed to identify a human need that you saw in the world and then develop a product that would fit that need. And so it was sort of the combination of those two classes where each of us came into those classes with sort of, you know, slightly different but very similar ideas. And they centered around the lack of healthy food and primarily in schools. They focused on the some of the social needs around the epidemic of obesity, heart disease, diabetes that we're seeing in our communities, particularly in underserved and lower income communities. And so those two things came together into what became our kind of product solution and our business plan in those two different classes. The product solution being we wanted to find a way to make high quality, healthy food accessible to schools and families who were reliant on school meals as the primary source of nutrition for their kids. And then the business plan was focused on how can we actually build a sustainable model for impact? What should the structure of that company be? And what kind of a team do we need to bring together? And so we used those two classes throughout our second year of our MBA program to both kind of refine what we wanted to do and refine what the mission would be, but then also to raise money to start the company and get a pilot program off the ground. So let's just roll it back a little bit. Why did you even care about this issue? Did you have kids at that point? Had you been in the food business? You could have decided to take on fracking or air (laughs) pollution or whatever. Why this? What what about it spoke to you? What's your impetus for caring about school food and kids? Well, I grew up with both my parents were teachers. So education was the thing that I knew. (laughs) And it was the place that whenever I envisioned myself working, I think partly because my parents had always worked in schools, I envisioned myself working in a school, either as a teacher, a principal or an administrator. My personal passion was always, even from a young age, was around food and food access. I remember when I was 13, hearing Francis Moore LaPay speak about how the world has enough food to feed people. It's just a matter of getting it to the right places and having the right diet, a diet for a small planet kind of philosophy. Even age 13, that inspired me to really always be thinking about the food system and how could we as a society build a food system that didn't leave anybody behind and that made food equitably accessible to everybody. And it wasn't until I got to business school that I recognized that that's not just something to read about and care about and advocate for in my personal life, but it was something that I could actually see a connection to what this could look like from a professional standpoint. Talking with Kristen, who worked both in and around schools, but also came from more of a business perspective, we both came together and said, there's a real opportunity and a need in schools. We care a lot about food. We feel comfortable in the school environment. That's an environment that both of us had worked in. We knew a lot of people who worked in schools, and it was easy to go and talk to friends of ours who were principals or who were charter school leaders or who were working in schools in one form or another. And every person in the education sector that we talked to said, this is such a huge need and nobody's really doing anything about it. And this was at a time when there was a lot of entrepreneurship emerging and like education technology and curriculum development and and school reform and all of these different pieces. But food was not a part of it, except for in a few 
very concentrated places where philanthropy had come in and taken a deep dive into individual school districts. We were at UC Berkeley and Alice Waters was extremely involved in the Berkeley school system at the time. So we sat down and talked with her and got inspired by what she was doing and what she was thinking about. But we really saw that nobody was doing something that was addressing the issue at a larger scale. I understand the problem. I understand the issue. But were either of you at all familiar with what it would take to do large scale feeding? Either of you know how to cook or (laughs) have any idea? (laughs) <laughs> Not to put too big a pin in it, but I love the idea. I understand the problem and I understand the idea of we need a solution to this problem. But did you know anything? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know a lot. And we were very, I would say, we were like sponges in our learning. We would go and talk to anybody who would talk to us about both the sort of logistics and operations of what it would take and the innovation and the approach that was needed to address the needs of the particular schools that we were initially focused on, which was, and actually, which continues to be a a large part of our focus, schools who don't have kitchens. There are a, a lot of schools in our country over the last 30, 40 years, the kitchens that they built 30, 40 years ago have become defunct and schools need a solution for food that doesn't necessarily entail spending millions of dollars rehabbing a kitchen and bringing in a chef and that sort of thing. We tried to talk to people who could help us to understand what it would take to bring fresh food into that kind of an environment and not necessarily cook the food on site in the school cafeterias. We also talked to a lot of people who could help us to understand the supply chain dynamics of the food system. The first person that we hired was a chef who had cooked at a larger scale than either of us ever had. (laughs) She also learned alongside us for the first decade of building the company. Our approach was really to create the environment that we could bring experts into as we grew. We figured out what were the areas that we knew the least about, and we tried to hire people to come in and be experts in those areas, whether it was food operations, logistics, menu design, um, nutrition compliance. You know, We could kind of see all the pieces that were needed, but knew that we didn't have the, the personal experience and expertise to do it all ourselves. So did you start with the money or did you start with a particular school that you could sort of beta test? What did you do first? We had one school that was willing to beta test with us in Oakland, which was fantastic. It was a charter school. Actually, the parents in that school, although the students, I think it was like 98% of the students qualified for free lunch. So it was a very low income charter school. The parents had collectively voted to not have a publicly funded school lunch program because they hadn't been able to find any food source that they thought was good enough for their kids. When we talked to that school leader, she said, hey, if you've got an idea of how to do this differently, please come and we'll be your test market. And so we ran our pilot program there. In those first couple of years, we actually had a partnership with our regional Whole Foods store the regional leadership of Whole Foods at the time were all big supporters of what we were doing. So we tapped into their supply chain. We got our little tiny kitchen set up as if we were a Whole Foods store. So the trucks would stop by and drop off fruit and bread and all the things that we needed to put together into our meals. It was just amazing having the leader of that school say, we're willing to be your pilot because we learned so much about everything from how the food needed to be packaged so it could be delivered in the hundreds at a time to what the balance of food groups and nutrients needed to be in each meal to so that they would be able to qualify for reimbursement under the federal government programs, all the documentation that was required, what it would take to make sure that every meal that kids ate was hot. And from the beginning, first lunch period, all the way to the last lunch period, it was an incredible chance to test and and get feedback on a daily basis. We were both in the kitchen in the morning and then in the cafeteria in the midday to gather feedback from kids every single day. And what did you discover that kids would and wouldn't eat? What did you learn about the appetites of children? Because we all know you can put healthy food out there. It can be hot. It can be all sorts of things. And nobody eats it. Yeah. What did you learn? (laughs) Well, we had a lot of people that we talked to who said, oh, kids will never eat healthy food. They won't choose the healthier option. And so we sat down with kids and asked them what they liked and what they didn't like. Almost every kid we talked to said they love fresh fruit. So that became a big part of our commitment was we're going to make sure that we have good, high quality, fresh fruit in every meal that we serve because we know that's healthy and we know it's something that kids will like. 
Vegetables are a tougher sell with kids, as anybody who has kids knows. So we focused on ways to season the vegetables so that kids would be willing to at least try them. We focused on designing the menu to be focused around both kind of familiar foods that kids wouldn't find terribly surprising, but that we knew they would eat, but then also making sure that we had meals that were really relevant to the families that we were serving. That has evolved in, in many different ways in the different communities that we operate in now. In that first school, it was making sure we had great Latin foods like enchiladas and burritos, and we had to flavor the rice and beans in just the right way that was relevant for that particular community. And we've done that in many different environments as well. So you look at the population of the school and you put together a menu that looks like the kind of things that they will eat. And when you say in your little tiny kitchen, I have to assume you had some kind of a, even if it was small, commercial kitchen at that point that we did. you could get inspected and... Yeah. Yeah. So in that first year we set up, uh, we were actually subleasing space from a commercial catering company. We came in at 3 a.m. and worked until early afternoon. And then they came in and did their thing from early afternoon all the way into the night when they did their nights and weekend events that they would they supported. And we were in there early morning when they weren't there. So that worked out great in our first year. But then very quickly, we had to move into larger facilities. Our next kitchen that we built out was actually a former McDonald's restaurant that we completely rehabbed and renovated into a healthy school food little factory. And then we've moved into an even larger, we call it culinary center now, where we're producing in, in Northern California here, we're producing and delivering close to 100,000 meals every day out of that one kitchen. Wow. And did either you or Kirsten have kids at this point? I'm thinking of you going in at 3 a.m. And I am someone who's been in the restaurant business. I know what that does to your life. How did all that work? Well, over the course of building the company between 2006 and 2014, we had five kids between the two of us. <laughs> Kristen actually had her first baby right when we were raising our first round of financing, just before we served our first meal. My first baby was born about a year later, and we sort of took turns from there. <laughs> Amazing. So we now have, we now each have a couple teenagers and I still have one that's not a teenager yet. She's eight years old, but, but it's been quite a journey building the company and raising families at the same time. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. When did the idea of taking it on a road, marching across the country come about? When I first came across you, you were a little bit like an army conquering school district after school district. Where did that fit in? Yeah, well, I would say that started very early. So when we first started, we really did have a vision of creating a national model. And we ended up bringing in investors who believed in the same thing, who believed that scale and growth would drive success in the company and would drive impact from a mission standpoint. So I would say it kind of came from the sort of virtuous cycle of our wanting to build a large scale impact and finding investors who similarly saw an investment thesis that said, hey, if you invest in growth, then you can have both impact and create value in the business. So we expanded to Southern California in our second year in 2008. And from there, we expanded across the country into Texas, Colorado, D.C., Boston, New Jersey, and continued to expand from there. Wow. Fighting all the way and learning a whole lot about different kids and what they would and wouldn't eat, and also about the policy issues under it. And we will hear more from Kirsten Toby in just a moment. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. 
Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. And we're back with Kirsten. When you were setting up the company, did people approach it as a philanthropic thing to do and they should give money because it was a good thing to do? Or was there really an expectation on the part of the either the venture capital people that you went to or the investors that they would make money? Interestingly, some of our earliest investors were the kind of folks that now call themselves impact investors. I think that was a term of art yet when we were first starting, but... Could you explain that a little bit? The philosophy of impact investing is that you can build or invest in a a company that is a for-profit company that by its very operations is creating a positive impact. One of the best examples of this that people understand easily is solar power, right? That if you invest in a company that's putting solar panels onto houses and commercial buildings, that by itself is creating a positive impact in the world. And it's building a business. It's something you can build a profitable business around. So our theory was that you could create a business that is providing healthy school meals and every meal that we serve is creating a positive impact. We and our investors felt that we could build a profitable model to do that. That part, the profitability piece has actually been one of the most challenging parts of it for us because unlike in many industries, we're in an industry where the price is a is a ceiling, right? The federal reimbursement rate that is provided for school meals provides a, a cap on how much mm-hmm. can be charged per meal. And so when you're trying to provide a high quality meal for a low price, it creates a challenging business model. We're still trying to prove out where the investor return can come from in the model, but the passion behind the investment that we've brought in has been real. And I think there is, there's a kind of collective vision that, that there actually is a way to build a both impactful from a mission and a social standpoint and impactful from a financial return standpoint. And that's the driver behind the investment that we've brought in to date. Hmm. I think most people don't understand that the whole school food area is so highly regulated and so tightly banded in terms of the dollars involved that every school district gets to decide on its own what its budget is for school food. And that's a certain maximum of price. And of course you have uh, the mandate to buy healthy natural food. And as those prices cramp you, that's kind of difficult. And you have a lot of infrastructure to work with. I look at school food as an important input to education, that it isn't just that kids are hungry, but kids are hungry. And it isn't only that many, many children get most of their daily nutrition or weekly nutrition in school, but it also is something which really affects their ability to learn. How have you thought about that? Yeah, we believe strongly that healthy food is an essential part of the educational experience. And it makes it a lot harder for kids to learn if they're either hungry because they don't like the food that's being served or if they're being served food that's just not giving them the right kind of energy that they need to learn. I would say, and I said this kind of in the beginning, I think that California has been thinking about this sort of at a state policy level has been Mm -hmm. focused in many ways on the right things, which is, you know, in order to enable all kids to have the right sort of food and learning environment, you need to make school food universal. So you don't have that kind of differentiation between, oh, some kids get free food at school and some kids get to bring what they want. If you just make it a given that every kid can get a school meal, that just, it changes the school food environment completely and it makes it much more normalized for everybody to just go through the school lunchroom. We have also seen, and this may be just environmental, but within California, you've got the state practically can sustain itself as a food system. And so there is just the the, the potential for local food and the potential for building mm-hmm. like true kind of local food ecosystems is my feeling is that if you can't do it in California, I can't imagine how you mm-hmm. can do it anywhere else. <laughs> so it's a, I listen um, to you. Yeah, I'm way across the country in a place where we only grow about 12% of our own food. So I would agree with you, if you can't do it in California, you can't do it elsewhere. But in many ways, those of us who live elsewhere need it the most. So that's problematic. Yeah, although I, I do think that's where policies can help, right? Like with bringing in universal school meals, that gives schools really just more funding to be able to invest in their school food programs. If they can know that all of their kids are going to be eating 
more regularly and they can rely on that on the income that's coming in from the reimbursement rates at the at both the state and the national level that can be an important piece i also think that having clear standards around the usda does put in place kind of basic nutrition standards for school meals but they don't necessarily have standards around things like how much sugar is allowed to be in school food and some of the other things that are where it can create a meal that's compliant but not necessarily healthy they don't have usda doesn't provide guidelines around preservatives mm-hmm. and other kind of harmful additives that can be added to foods and make foods be more heavily processed than they should be or or need to be those are the kinds of things that can help ideally at a federal level we're seeing it happen in some places at a state level just creating more guidelines around what does it mean to provide healthy food and making sure that food is made in a way that kids are going to like it and that it tastes good and that it is culturally relevant. I think those are the other pieces that just ensure that more food is going to get consumed. Well, I'm hoping that some of the initiatives that came out of the the White House conference last month will translate into universal school food. But I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful. What do you see that we have to do to make something like that happen? You've always had a strong interest in political action. Yeah, I guess one of the challenges is that school food has become so politicized. It's sort of a shame that it becomes red versus blue thing, whether kids should get food at school or not. (laughs) It feels like there is something that's just so universal about like who doesn't want their kids to be well nourished. I'm not a political expert, but it but part of me just feels like if we could get beyond the politics of it and find alignment around the idea of nourishing kids, that just feels like the direction that we need to go. I think that just having the conversation that the White House has started to open up and talking about food from a unified perspective and getting all the agencies focused on Mm -hmm. it, that seems like it's the right way to go so that you're not, I love the whole concept of we should have a department of food or a, a federal agency that actually is just focused on food, that's focused on the sort of food and nutrition pieces and not necessarily on all of the other aspects or or that kind of brings together the other aspects. But right now we don't have an agency that's um, whose sole focus is on the potential for food to be a lever for health. We have a health department, we have a agriculture department, we've got our education department, but bringing those together seems like one of the right steps in the right direction to create alignment around what's the end goal, which is that we want to have healthy kids and that they can grow into healthy adults. Amen. I have just a couple of last questions. Like, what have you discovered is the number one preferred lunch for kids? <laughs> what is it that no matter where you go, culturally relevant or not, kids actually, you know, chow up? <laughs> I mean, I have to say, our, I wish I could say that it's, you know, like a Cobb salad or something like that. But it is a, <laughs> no matter what we put on the menu, the things that we sell the most of end up being hamburgers. But it's like a high quality beef turkey blend patty with a whole grain bun. Kids do love different pasta dishes. And we make those with a whole grain pasta, whether it's spaghetti and meatballs. And, and then I would say the next level of favorite is tends to be a more diverse array depending on where you are. So in some communities, it's chicken teriyaki. In some communities, it's a pupusa. In others, it's our enchiladas. That And that's where our focus on making culturally relevant meals accessible and compliant that fit into the school meal program comes in. Hmm. Great. And what do your kids eat? Do they eat? <laughs> are, they, are they as difficult as everybody else's kids? Or have you been sort of whipping them into uh, culinary shapes and saying, we <laughs> Well, so I have three kids and I have to say, I my three kids, despite growing up in the same household, they have extremely different tastes in food. I have one that will eat absolutely anything and who is super adventurous in her eating. One who was a very picky kid and now like loves her, you know, avocado toast. And now that she's 12 and 13, she can make her own. She lo- she hated anything that was green and now she loves avocados and kale. I think it just takes 
growing up a little bit. And then my youngest still continues to be super picky and it's a struggle to get her to eat her broccoli. So I try my best and I have many similar struggles that, that other families have. The one thing I will say is that I think there's something to be said for not having a, the sort of junky foods super accessible. We don't have a lot of that around in the house. So if the kids are hungry, they have to eat what's in the fridge and that tends to be healthier stuff. Well, we all have at least one who subsists only on pasta. I mean, <laughs> well, thank you so much. This is great. I'm glad to see that Revolution Foods has weathered the pandemic and is making the kind of adjustments that will allow you to continue to thrive and grow. I'm pulling for you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Thank you so much, Louisa. I'm, I'm such an admirer. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kirsten. We'll be following the Revolution Foods path as it travels the complex school food future. To stay in the know, check them out at revolutionfoods.com. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk About Food is produced by The Food Voice. I'm producing, along with audio director and composer Mike Moss, of Soundscape Boston. You can find more of our stories at our website, letstalkaboutfood.com, and on Heritage Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's Talk About Food is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.